All right, welcome everybody. It's good to see everybody in here. We are going to have a fun time today. A lot of people ask me, hey, listen, what questions am I going to see on the state exam? Now, a little disclaimer, we don't know the questions that are going to be exactly on the state exam, but we have some pretty good ideas of what you're going to see. Um, I've been teaching the real estate class now for quite a few years. It's been, uh, I believe I'm on year number seven, and I do the cram classes. And as you know, if you're a member of our group, a lot of people, even today, said, hey, thank you so much for all the help. I passed the exam. One of our goals is to get you through the state exam on the first try. Now, listen, if it doesn't happen on the first try, it's okay. We're here to support you, right? It does take a lot of studying. It does take a lot of hard work. But that's what we're here for. We're here to try to get everybody through it. And actually, it's about a 50-50 uh, chance you're going to get through. We want to put that up to 90-10. That's what our goal is, to get you up there to 90-10 or 100%. That is our goal. Now, I want to tell you on Saturday, this coming Saturday, and there's going to be a link in the comments or I'll post it right after. We have a cram class coming, and it's going to be from 9 a.m. to we're going to, we actually used to go to three, but we're going to go to five this Saturday. We're going to try to get all the information in, everything that you need to know, and, you know, just have a good time. And believe it or not, every time that I have the class, everybody at the end of the day goes, I can't believe time went by so fast. I had a good time. So we try to make it fun. We try to throw some jokes in there. We have a good time learning. I think that really helps when we do that. Now, let's go ahead and nail this one. we got 10 questions today. It'll probably take us 30 minutes, 35 uh, 40 minutes, whatever. We're going to go over 10 questions. It's going to be similar to what we do on the in the cram session, but a little bit different. We usually review all the chapters, or as many as we can on that day, and we do a, a quick quiz after each one. Today, what we're going to do is we'll look at questions that we're pretty sure you're going to see them or something very similar to them on the state exam. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these questions. If you have any questions, okay, if you have any questions, please make sure to put them in the comments, okay? If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and put it in there. If you are watching on Facebook, just go ahead and there's a little thing that says, um, let StreamYard know who you are. It's okay to push that. It's, there's no like really big secret. It's just us in this Facebook group anyway. So if you have any questions, please hit us with the questions. What I would like you have you do is participate a little bit in the uh, on the exam as well, as well. We've got a lot of viewers on here right now, so it's kind of cool. It's a fun thing. So participate the best you can. We'll have a good time with this, and uh, we're going to have fun with it, okay? That's our goal. That's our number one goal, have fun and learn a lot. Here we go. Let's go ahead and get cranked up. Question number one, question number one. I'm going to go ahead and take myself off the screen a little bit um, so we don't distract anybody. Uh, let's get over here. Boom. Hi, hey, Kurt. You got it. Way to go. I'm glad you're on. That's awesome. And you're, I think you're actually on, on uh, YouTube, so that's good. All right. Perfect. We just talked on the phone. Okay. Question number one. What is the status of a sales associate license if the required post-licensing education is not completed prior to the renewal cycle? Normally, that's between 18 months and between 18 months. I like it. People are already, way to go, Barbara. Uh, people are already answering. That's awesome. It's usually going to be between 18 and 24 months, depending on when you get your exam, right? So this one is going to be very easy. I do not want you to get, and I'm going to be looking over here a little bit because I'm going to use my pen and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to try to give you a couple things to um, really hone in on and, and try to focus on. When you see this question, okay, when you see this question, you want to look at this and say, okay, I see it says post, right? That's going to be, you've got, you've got about two years to, to do that after you pass your test, right? 18 to 24 months. If you see that, if you do not have that done within that period of time, or if you haven't completed your education, then your license is going to become null and void. It's going to become null and void. Let's go ahead and just make sure we got that one right. Null and void. I really appreciate everybody uh, chiming in. Casey, it's good to see you on there as well. Got some Facebook people in there. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Now, let's go ahead and just look at the, the explanation on this. The licensee must complete continuing education, which includes the 45-hour post-education, and renew the license to either active or involuntary inactive status within two years. 
a license that is placed in voluntary inactive status for no more than two years. Okay, so they're only going to leave that license there for two years. Once you get that license, they're only going to leave it there for two years in an inactive status. After that two years, it's going to be null and void. Let me ask you guys a question real quick on the Facebook group. Okay, on the Facebook and on YouTube. If if after the two year period, you do not complete that assignment, you do not complete that 45 hour post. What is going to happen to your license? Again, I'm just exercising a little bit of a repeat here. It's going to be null and void, null and void. OK, that is something you're probably going to see on that state exam. All right. Everybody good with that? Uh, put myself on there a little bit so you can see me. All right. Here we go. Let's go on to the next one. Next question. This is a fun one, right? This is going to be fun. How many sections are in a township? How many sections in a township? Okay. Anybody know that one? I see some Bs, which is 36, 36, 36. This is going to be a question that you potentially will see on the state exam. I have been told that it's something very similar. Okay. So 36. Very good. My Facebook users. Let's go to the next slide and see. 36 sections. 36 sections. Good job, Kurt. Way to go, Barbara. Good job, Casey. Way to go. Now, let's go ahead and break this down. I'm going to take myself off the screen again. Just so you guys, I won't get in your way. Let's break this down. Each township is divided into 36 sections. Each section is one square mile or 640 acres. It's very important you remember that number. 640 acres make up a section. Because when you get in the math section uh, and you go back and look at our math uh, from last Thursday, you're going to see that in there. Okay. Sections are numbered in an S pattern. Now, what do we mean by S pattern? They go like this, okay? They go, it goes like a serpentine. I like to call it the snake, right? It goes like this, right? And we're going to explain this a little bit further here, okay? It's a serpentine, okay? Very important you remember that because what they're going to do is they're going to ask you a question on the state exam and you're going to be trying to figure it out. I'm going to show you exactly how you're going to nail it, okay? How you're going to get through that without much problem, okay? Okay. Sections are numbered in an S pattern beginning in the northeast upper right corner, which is going to be number one, okay? The sections are numbered from one in the northeast corner, then they consecutively go west through number six. Now, why did they do this, okay? Why did they do this? The reason why they did this is they measured with chains back in the day. So what they did is they went with the chain one mile, okay? They went one mile to number from one to two and then from two to three to four to five to five to six six to seven they went down so they took that one mile chain and they went down with it okay very important and then they went to the right and then they went down again to from 12 to 13 and then to the left okay so they wiggled it through and that's how they that's how they did it so you're going to remember on the state exam remember the serpentine i like to call it the snake it wraps around and it goes from one to 36, okay? The second numbers then wrap around in an S pattern. The second horizontal row begins directly under the section six, and it progresses west to east, left to right. Seven to 12, section 13 is directly under 12, and it moves west, and it goes to the last row, and it goes down. This method of number is repeated until the section number 36 is reached in the southwest um, lower corner. Okay, so very important to remember how that is. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to visualize what this is going to look because you might not have this on the state exam to look at or you will not have it on the state exam to look at. So what I want you to do is visualize how this is going to look. Now, I've done this a little bit for you. Okay, I've done this a little bit for you. I'm going to go ahead and put you put, put this beside me. Okay, uh, that doesn't work too good because I'm it's a little bit too. Now, look at this real quick. If you look at the top, okay, look at the top, you will notice you've got north, east, south, west, okay? Now, in the state exam, you might get a question that says, which section is 
directly west of six. Can anybody tell me? Can anybody tell me which section is directly west of six? I got some I got some answers in my YouTube group. Which one is directly west of six? Anybody there? Okay, good. I see Melinda, nice job with the one. Casey, great job with the one. Okay. If you go right west, now if you look up here, you have just think about the state of Florida. We know north is going to be towards Tallahassee, right? Jacksonville, if you're in Naples. Okay. If you go where I'm at, if you go east, it's going to be Miami. If you go west, you're going to be out in the Gulf. But try to picture this, this format when you do your state exam very important you kind of get an idea now real quick i'm going to ask you which section is south of 22 section 22 which section is south of 22 can anybody give me the answer on that one got a few of them coming up got a few of them coming up South of 22, south of 22. South is going to be here. Oh. Got me in the escape mode here. South of 22. Okay, very good. 27, 27. Now, I'm going to tell you the best way to go ahead. If you take the state exam at the testing center, you are given either paper or pencil, but normally... It's going to be a dry erase tablet, okay? It's going to be a tablet that has a dry erase on it, all right? 27, great job. Good job, Kurt, Barbara, Noah, excellent. Now, when you go into the state exam, go ahead and take that tablet and start drawing a little bit on it. Now, if you take it at home, you got to have a mental vision because if you start drawing stuff when you take it at home, they're going to really frown upon that and they could shut you right out. But let's go ahead and do this. What I want you to do is just draw five lines that up and down, five lines up and down. There's five there, right? And what I want you to do is I want you to draw five lines like this, okay? Now, when you do that, you can go ahead and you can plug, you can plug your numbers in. There's going to be number one. There's going to be number two, number three, okay? Number four, okay? Five, okay, everybody got that? And number six, I can't draw too good with the mouse, but I'm doing my best. Then we know that we can't come back over here. We got to go directly down. Now, what I want you to do is when you're, if you get this question on the exam, you will be able to fill all this in and make sure you, you visualize which one would be above and below it, right? Because it's a duplicate of it. And I want you to go ahead and that's going to be one easy answer that you're going to get on the state exam. It's going to be great. Remember, all you need to do is just do five of those. Okay. We'll go backwards here a little bit. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. We go one, two, three, four, five, and then five this way. Boom. And then go ahead and fill in your numbers. And then if they say on the state exam, which section is due east of uh, so let's say this, this, yeah, due east of number four, section four. Which section is due east of number four? We've got it right there. It's going to be section three. Okay. Everybody good with that? All right. Excellent. A very good way to go ahead and get through that state exam. Okay. That's going to be important. Have that mental, have that mental compass in your head, north, south, east, and west. Okay. Everybody good with that? North, south, east, and west. All right. Let's go ahead to the next question. Let's go ahead to the next question. Which lien below would take priority over all the other liens? Does anybody know the answer to this one? If you do, go ahead. I'm going to give you a second to put it in. Which lien below would take priority over all the others? Okay, I see a C. I see another C. Very good. I don't know who it is, the Facebook user. Where's my uh, YouTube folks? Are they on? All right, C, C, good job, Melinda. Noah, great job, C. Okay, let's look at this real quick. Seems like a fairly easy question, but it can trip you up. Do not let it trip you up. 
we know that if you see this word real estate taxes or property taxes, real estate taxes or property taxes, that is going to be a priority one. Okay. Priority. That's going to be a priority lien. Okay. Very important. If you see the word special assessment, special assessment, that's going to be another priority lien. Okay. Very important to remember that. Now we see here on these dates, you probably will not have a date that's exactly the same, but if you see real estate and property taxes and those dates do, they, uh, if you see real estate property taxes and special assessments, those are something you're going to have to pay attention. If you see those answers and nothing else close to it, then you know it's going to be either real estate or special assessment. Again, anytime that they want to get the money, the government wants to get their money from your property tax. And we say government, local government, special assessments, uh, your property taxes. They want to make sure that's taken care of and paid up. OK, so it's going to be real estate, property taxes, lien there. Superior liens. Superior liens take priority over all other liens. There's junior liens and superior liens. They are automatically superior to other liens. Three superior liens that are uh, that we have, and I'll get myself out of the way here. Three superior liens are real estate property liens, which become a lien January 1st. Every January 1st, your property taxes are a lien if they're not paid. Okay, so that's very important to remember. Special assessments, special assessment liens. What is a special assessment? They could be putting new sewer system in. They could be putting uh, new water. Uh, they could be doing a lot of different things. It could be paving the streets. Those are potential assessments. Those need to be paid. Now, this next one, be very careful on this. This is going to be the federal estate tax, federal estate tax lien. Okay. This is not going to be your taxes that you pay on your income tax. This is going to be federal estate tax. So make sure you are aware of the differences on those. All right. Very good. Very good. You guys are doing great. I like the participation. We've got a lot of people in the group. Question number four. We're already here. What are the rights associated with land abutting tidal bodies of water, such as an ocean or a sea? Okay. Anybody know what these will be? What are rights associated with land abutting tidal bodies of water, such as an ocean or sea? Does anybody know which one this is? Does anybody know what this one is? Okay, we've got a couple people that, now we got a couple people that say B, a couple say C, a couple say anything else? We got B, Kurt's there, Barbara with the B. Okay, let's look at this very closely. We'll go ahead and get the answer for you. It's going to be lectoral rights, okay? Lectoral rights, right? If you see anything that says uh, bodies of water, such as an ocean or sea, that's going to be usually like a lake, right? Something that's not going to be going past you, okay? If, it's, if it says anywhere that it's flowing past you, that's going to be riparian. And I like to remember this very easily. Littoral, littoral starts with an L. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Riparian, such as river that goes fast and past your property, that's going to be riparian rights, okay? That's going to be riparian rights. So make sure we get that one. Littoral rights are associated with land abutting tidal bodies of water, such as an ocean or sea or a lake. Littoral uh, uh, owners own land that abuts the water that is non-flowing, essentially, including ponds and lakes. Littoral rights include oceanfront property and gulf front property. The littoral rights include ownership of the land, adjacent to the water up to the average water mark okay up to the average high water mark all right now i like to remember this again the toral starts with an l just like lake does uh, that's good too hannah great it goes uh literally to the high water mark littoral rights that is how i remember it great that's good that you bring that up there because it helps everybody in the group and on the session all right now, remember that word R, riparian, sounds kind of like a little bit like river. So when you see that, you'll be you'll be good to go. Thanks for the tip. Great job. All right. We're getting a lot of uh, a lot. I like Casey. B or C. I like that one. Uh, that's good. 
Uh, Casey's in the group. She's very, uh, she stays really busy in the group. And uh, the Facebook group, if you're not in there, make sure to jump in on that Facebook group. It's really good. Uh, we have a fun time in there as well. All right. Let's go ahead and let's talk about the next one. Question number five. Question number five. Now, the reason why I put this up there, and I'm going to try to take this off a little bit here so you guys can see. Um, the reason why I put this up there, there was actually a question in the group yesterday just like this. It's the same question, okay? But I wanted to put it up there because some people um, – Thought that they answered it correctly, which if you're a math person, okay, if you're a math person, um, you, you, you knew that it wasn't right, but it's great when people answer it and, and get it. What we got to be careful to do is we got to look at this closely. A warehouse measures 720 feet by 500 feet, right? So we know to get the square footage of that, we must multiply those together, okay? And it rents for $118,000 a month. Okay, it's a big, big uh, bill there, but we know it's a big place, right? So what we need to do, and we'll we'll go we'll break this down. It's pretty easy if you break it down. You just got to remember to do it the right way. The answer on this one is going to be B. Okay, it's going to be B. Now, why is it going to be B? Be very careful on this. Okay, be very careful. Some people um, pick C because it's it's a quick a quick thing. All right. What we want to do is a warehouse measures 720 uh, feet by 500 feet, and it rents for $118,000 a month. What is the rent per square foot per month? That's what we're asking. What is the rent per square foot per month? Be very careful. If you do this quickly, you might come up with C, okay? But what you need to do, you're, you have a tendency to multiply 720 times 500, which gives you 360, 360,000 square feet, and then you divide it by 118. Don't do this, okay? This is, this is not correct, okay? What you need to do is go down here, okay, right here. You must do this to get the right answer. You need to multiply 720 by 500, gives us that same number, but you must divide 118, 118,000 by the square feet, okay, okay, which gives you this number, and if you round it up, it's 0.33. Is everybody good with that? The difference is on this is don't divide the 360 by 118. Divide 118, you want to divide 118 by, okay, I'll go ahead and do this, 118, 118,000, you want to divide that by the <clears throat> square footage, okay? That's going to give you the right number. It's hard to do it with a mouse. I'm doing my best, okay? 360,000 square feet, okay? And that's going to give you the number of 0.33. So let's go back to the, the answers I gave you. Be really careful because they will give you, as you can see, they will give you this number right here. You're going to go ahead and answer it real quick. Boom. Right? When you answer it, you're going to be like, I got it right. That's called the that's called the right, wrong answer. Okay? They do that a lot on the state exam. You're going to be very excited because you'll be like, ah, I see the answer. I got it. Okay? Just be careful because if you, do, if you answer it that way, it's going to be wrong. Okay? So make sure you take the time, break it down. One thing I like to do on this is reverse it, okay? Reverse it. Let's go ahead and reverse this real quick. Um, I'm sorry on that. I'm going to have to clear that page real quick. Let me um, erase all on the slide. Okay. If you do this backwards, you will see that $3.05 times 360 square feet, right? You see that? That's going to be a lot of money. That's going to be over a million dollars per month for rent. So we know that's not going to be the answer. Okay. So again, I, I like that. Somebody wrote, I, I hate the way they give you the wrong answer. I know because you get so excited. You're like, I got it. And then it's the right, wrong answer. But they do that just to make sure you understand the concepts and theories behind it. Okay. Everybody good with that one. Okay. Everybody good with that one. I really appreciate the feedback. We got a lot of people on, which is good. 
Let's go to question number six. We're going to go, we got 10 questions. So you're going to get these on the state exam and you guys are going to do great. When a sales associate works with both parties in a transaction, he or she is in which type of relationship with those parties? Which type of relationship are they with those parties? Can you go ahead and write your answers in? Which type of relationship are they in with those parties? Anna says A. Do we have anybody else with the A's? What type of relationship are we in? Noah, there you go. Kurt, good job. Now, why are we in an A relationship, a transaction broker relationship? Okay, why are we in that? Well, first off, in the state of Florida, that's the only one we are authorized to be in if we were working with both parties, okay? If we are working with both parties as a single agent in both parties, that would be called dual agency, which perfect. You guys got it. Dual agency is not permitted and is illegal in the state of Florida. So in a transaction relationship, we don't have total obligation. Uh, we, we, there's a couple of things. We don't have total obedience. We don't have total loyalty. We don't have full disclosure. We don't have full confidentiality with either side. We have limited, right? So in this case, we are going to be in a transaction broker relationship because we are working with both, both sides. Now, one thing you might see on the state exam is you might see a question that says, what is the default relationship in the state of Florida? Does anybody know what that one's going to be? That's going to be the same thing. It's going to be transaction broker relationship. That's the default in Florida. So if you look at number D, that's going to be a wrong one, but uh, number D um, is not is not correct. So the default with no paperwork signed, you are in a transaction broker relationship. Okay. Good job on that one. Let's go ahead and break this down a little bit. Under Florida law, it's presumed that all licensees are operating as transaction brokers unless a single agent or no brokerage relationship is established in writing with the customer. In other words, if you're going to be in a single agent relationship or you're going to be in a non-rep relationship, paperwork has to be signed by all parties. Okay. Everybody needs to know. Because a transaction broker does not represent the seller or the buyer of both parties in a fiduciary capacity, Florida law refers to the parties as customers. Okay. A lot of times we'll say, I got a client. And the reality is if you're working in a transaction brokerage relationship, they're really called customers. Okay. They're really called customers because we can't technically be in a client relationship unless we're in a single agent relationship situation. 95% of all brokerages in the state of Florida operate as transaction brokers. Um, some do operate as single agent and a lot of them will allow for non-rep, but that's something we'll explain a little bit further as we go. Nice job, everybody. Good answers. Good participation. All right. Question number seven. Question number seven. This is one I put on my last math class. If you want to go through the group and you want to look down last Thursday, we did a live and we did five questions, five math questions you'll see on the state exam. And it, it's a great, great thing. And then also, if you go to the YouTube channel, you'll see all the math you'll need to know to pass the state exam. So make sure you go there. I love to give that information out. It's very good. Okay. This next question, a building is three stories high and each floor is 150 by 50, okay, square feet. If 20% of each floor could not be used, how many bins would fit in the building if each bin was five by five, okay? I don't expect you to give me a quick answer on this one. We'll go ahead and we'll break this one down, but the answer is gonna be 720 and let's go ahead and break this down. You will see this, this is called the bin question, right? You will see this on the state exam almost for sure, okay? The numbers will be a little bit different, but it's the same principle, same process, same way to go through it, okay? First, we must determine how many, how much space is on each floor, okay? So if each floor is 150 by 50, that's gonna be a total of, it's gonna be a total of 7,500 square feet, 7,500 square feet. Now, if we have a building that's got three floors, what do we got to do? We got to multiply that by three. Okay. We got three floors. So they want to know on each floor, three 
times 7,500 gives us 22,500 square feet, all right? 22,500 square feet. Now, we can only, they've told us in the example, we are only allowed to use 80%. So the other portion, which would be 20%, has to be pushed to the side. So what we need to do is we need to go ahead and figure out, okay, how much can we use? So what we do is we take that, we bring this down, right, this 22,500, and all we do is we multiply it by 0 0.80, which is the opposite of 0 0.20, because we you know, it makes a hole. So all we do is we bring that down, we multiply. That means at this point, we have 18,000 square feet that we are using or able to use for our bins, right? We're good. We got this one. So all we do is we take 18,000 right here. We divide it by 25, okay? Because we know each bin is five by five. If you've got something that's five by five, just think of a box, five feet by five feet. It's going to be a total of 25 square feet, okay? Now, each bin, you're going to divide this. And if you do that, 18,000 divided by 25 is going to give you a total of 720 bins, okay? This question is going to be on the exam. There might be one that's, that's going to talk about lots. It's going to be either this one or that one, but almost inevitably it's going to be there the numbers obviously will be different but when you see it and you follow the steps you'll be able to um, get a slam dunk on that okay very good very good all right anybody have any questions you can go ahead and throw them up in the group whether whether you're on youtube or whether you're on facebook um, wherever you're at we like questions okay now what i want to tell you though is a good thing is I want to tell you how tricky they can be. Um, as we discussed earlier, right? As we discussed earlier, uh, they will get tricky with the answers. So you got to really pay attention to them. Okay. When you when you look at these answers, they're going to try to trip you up. If you take the 22,000 and you divide it by 25, okay, and you forget to take out the the, the 20%, remember, we're not allowed to use the whole thing. If you do that, then it's going to give you 900. That answer is going to be on the exam. So you're going to think, oh, I got it right. Well, no, you got to go back and make sure you take the 800. Now, if you take the 750 and you forget to multiply it by three floors and take out the, take out the 20%, then you're looking at a number, another number of 300. Again, be careful on that. This is going to be the number. This is going to be the one that they're going to be uh, using. So again, they're going to try to trip you up. Just be aware of it. And then you'll know, okay, make sure you subtract that 20%. Make sure you do the three floors. If you don't, they'll get you. All right. Question number eight, we're almost through. We're almost through. This is a fun time. Which clause in the deed states the grantor? Now the grantor is the person who gives something, right? Just so you remember, if it's an OR on the end, it's the person given giving them. If it's an EE -E on the end, grantee, it's going to be the person receiving. So if you see that on the state exam in any place, remember the person receiving is going to be EE. -E. The person who's giving is going to be the OR. Which clause in a deed states the grantor owns the property and has the legal right to convey it? Okay. Which one's that going to be? Anybody know? Anybody got that one? This is going to be one that I want you to go ahead and this is going to be kept posted in the in our group. Go ahead and make a flashcard for this. Okay. This is going to be one of those where you're going to probably want to do a, a yeah, exactly. Kurt, you're right. Except mortgages because it's a little bit confusing. Go ahead and make a flashcard of this. This is going to be one that you need to make a flashcard. Okay. And let's take a look at this. It's going to be season. Okay. Season. Think about that. Just it's the season. The grantor owns a property and has the legal right to convey it, okay? Has the legal right to convey it. It's going to be season. Very good. For those of you who got that one right, Noah, I think you got it. Okay, season. Season, a covenant and a deed that warrants the grantor, the seller, holds the property by virtue of fee simple title and has complete right to dispose of same. It's also called seasons. You might, you might see it spelt that way. Um, I always like to say, Tis the season to be jolly. Think about that as Santa Claus. 
he gives it, he gives a gift, right? He is allowed to give it. Santa Claus is allowed to give the gift because he owns the gift at one time. His elves made it. He's allowed to give it. So when you see that on a state exam, think of it. Tis the season to be jolly. You're giving something away and you have the authority and you have the ability to give it because you own it. Okay. Make sure you guys get that one. Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. Let's go ahead. See if I can get link back in here a little bit. All right. Next question. Next question. A lot of good participation. Next question. This isn't one that I have been told. There's one very, very similar. Very easy question. This is another one we need to go ahead and make a flashcard for. Okay. We need to make a flashcard for. They're going to ask you what the acronym stands for. Okay. And they're going to give you a bunch of different acronyms. They're going to give you acronyms. They're going to give you a bunch of different questions. I want to see if you guys get this one. Let's go ahead and put it in the comments. Okay. What does the USPAP acronym stand for? What does it stand for? Unified Standard of Professional Approval Program, Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Program, Uniform Study of Program and Practices. Which one is it? All right, it looks like we got a consensus on this one. I like that. You guys are smart. Remember, write a flashcard for this because they're going to put something there and try to throw a curveball. If you do a flashcard on this, this is an easy question to get right. And that means you only have to get 99 more right. Okay, so you're good. Actually, you only get 75, but you only have to get 74 more right. Okay, so again, make sure you guys lock that one in. Very good. Very good. Last but not least, we're moving out pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and just do the definition. Just so you know, it's it, we want to learn this stuff as well, but the USPAP is a, is a standard for valuing real property. In other words, what they want to do is they want to have a consensus amongst everybody, and they want to make sure that everybody is doing things the same way. All the appraisers are doing things the appropriate way. Because what happens is if you've got an appraiser that's handling things differently, that could really uh, cause some problems. So the USPAP basically is a standard for valuing real property. USPAP uh, is a set of guidelines, standards, and practices to follow when providing appraisal services. Okay, USPAP's ethic rules concerns, um, uh, they rule concerns, conduct, management, confidentiality, and record keeping. So basically it's an oversight it's a watch. Uh, they they keep track of the appraisals, appraisers, and make sure that you know doing the same thing. Now, one quick question I want to ask you that you might see on the state exam: Can licensees, real estate professionals, can we do appraisals? Can we do appraisals? Let's look in the comments. Are we allowed to do appraisals as real estate um, professionals once you're licensed? Are we allowed to do appraisals? Answers in the comments. Hannah says no. Hannah says no. Another one? Yes, but not for a loan. We got a lot of no's in here. Don't get too wrapped up on that if someone puts it in there. Okay. Another no. Casey, they say yes, but not for a loan. Oh, okay. Can see him on here. Erica, no. Melinda, no. Lucy puts no. Okay. Geethro, no. Someone says yes. All right. I like this. Okay. Question that you might see on the state exam. We are allowed to do appraisals. We are allowed to do appraisals. Not a problem. Okay. The only time we cannot do appraisals. <laughs> Casey, I like that. She always makes me laugh. We are allowed to do appraisals, but we're not allowed to do appraisals for anything that's federally backed. Federally backed loans. I'll see if I can get the mic over a little bit. Hopefully you guys can hear it. A little bit better here. Anything is federally backed or if it's federally related, let's use that word. It's a better word. Federally related loans, we cannot do appraisals. However, if somebody calls us and says, I need an appraisal, we can do them as real estate professionals, but we must follow the USPAP guidelines. Okay. 
Normally, what we do is we do what's called a CMA. We talk about this in the cram session. We do a CMA. That's a um, comparative market analysis. And we do that um, to get business. Another question is, can we get paid to do an appraisal? Can we get paid to do an appraisal? The answer is yes, we can get paid to do an appraisal. It's part of our job. Do we usually get paid to do appraisals? Not so much. Do we usually get paid to do comparative market analysis? Not so much. Okay. What we do those for is we hope we can get a listing. So if somebody calls you and says, hey, I want a comparative market analysis on my house, you're going to be there hoping we're going we're gonna to get a listing contract and we're going to be able to list that house. Okay. Very good job, everybody. I appreciate everybody's feedback in here. You guys are doing a, a very good job. But if the, if the question comes up, can we do appraisals? The answer is yes. Matter of fact, it's one of our duties we're allowed to do. But if it says for a federally related loan, the answer is going to be no. VA, FHA, um, USDA, those type of things. Okay. So make sure you remember that. Can we get paid for them? Absolutely, we can. Does it happen much? No. I've been doing this for 21 years and never got paid for an appraisal. Okay, we have this thing we'll talk about in the cram class. It's called a broker's price opinion, but never get never get paid for them. But uh, we can do them. Okay, very important to know. All right, let's go ahead. Number 10. Let's go ahead. Number 10. This is this comes up. It's important that we do it. An unlicensed personal assistant may perform which activity? What can a personal assistant perform? Which activity out of this list, A, B, C, or D, can they do? Anybody tell me. Kurt said, that's going to be on the test. Yes, it could be. Very much so. Which one, Kurt? I think this one you're talking about? Yeah, this one could be on there. Okay. Absolutely. One good thing about the cram course is I don't put a lot of stuff that we haven't got information that it could possibly be on the exam. Usually the questions we have, I mean, what happens is, is there a pool of about 900 questions, 900 to 1,000. They dump them in. You don't know which one you're going to get, but we go over ones and we, we try to go over the stuff that you're going to see on the exam. Again, we can't be 100% that it's going to be on there, but we know that a question like that or similar is going to be on there. Okay. A lot of you got, oh, the appraisal one. Yes, that could be on there, Kurt. Definitely. Most definitely. Three-part question on there too. An unlicensed person assistance may perform which of the following? Conduct listing presentations for sellers. We know they can't do that. Big uh, can't do that one, right? Negotiate in the transaction. You got to be licensed. You're doing real estate work. Showings of property. Okay, you cannot leave your office and go show property if you're a assistant. Now, one thing you can do, and I don't want to try to make things confusing, but if you're in an open house, and you're an assistant, you are allowed to hand out literature. You are allowed to give material out, basically a brochure. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to speak on the house. You're not allowed to talk about the taxes. If they ask you a question about the house related, you just have to refer them back to the, the material that's on the pamphlet, right? Just want to make sure everybody understands that. The answer on this one is going to be, it's going to be D, deposit earnest money in the escrow account. Basically, they're going to do a lot of things that are, uh, secretarial type duties, mostly clerical. Okay. Mostly clerical type duties. Okay. Let's go ahead and get myself out of the way here real quick. <clears throat> Just some examples. And this is also going to be on the state exam. Chances are you're going to see something similar to this. Examples of duties, mostly clerical, answer the phone and forward calls, that type of things. Submit listings and changes to the uh, multiple listing. They can work in the MLS, which works out good. Follow up on loan commitments after a contract has been negotiated and generally secure the status reports. Basically, they can call for information, assemble documents for closing, uh, secure documents, uh, public information from the courthouse. They can go down and get information. Usually, as long as they're not working with a buyer or seller conversational, they might call them and ask them for a document. That's it. That'll be that'll be OK. As long as they're not in that negotiation. Have keys made for company listings, write ads, uh, receive records deposits, security deposits, advanced rent, um, type contract forms for approval by the licensee and supervising broker. Okay. Monitor licensees, uh, uh, licenses and personal files. I have an assistant that works with me. She is licensed so she can do all that stuff, but I also have another person that helps me out with my social media. They help me out uh, with some of my paperwork. They do that type of thing. They're not allowed to be in direct contact 
um, with with the buyers or the sellers or people that might be interested or prospects. Okay, when I say direct contact, they can give them information, but they can't give them. It has to be uh, written material. Okay, so everybody good with that? Kirk has a question. Does the sales associate or broker need to be at the open house? No, they do not need to be there. However, when somebody walks in, it's very difficult for an assistant to just say, here's the brochure. That's all I can really talk about. But they do not have to be there. They do not have to be there. It's very, very um, difficult for them to operate correctly. But what happens is, is, is I've worked with the assistant before and I, I told them, I said, when somebody walks in the house, you go over and hand them the information and you just tell them that you are an assistant. And unfortunately, I can't uh, give you any information, discuss taxes, things like that. What, you know, features of the house, things like that. Everything that you see on that brochure is, is the information that you've got. Okay. Just want to make sure you all get that. Um, very quick, very quick. If you want to be a, a member in, I say a member on the list and whenever you're ready, you just type stop. It'll stop. We go ahead and we send out two or three times a week. We send out a little text with some quizzes. They're real easy to do on the phone and, and they're all questions that you are likely to see. Okay. So go ahead and text that uh, your full name. We need your name in there uh, to 239-510-8250. Okay. 8250. Um, trying to think what else we got some more stuff. Ah, Kurt, they can assist with a sales associate while you are in an, an, with another comp, uh, customer. Um, a little bit more. We got this. So this Saturday, we have the exam cram class. I'm going to go ahead and put the link in there um, tomorrow. One thing I want to tell everybody is, uh, real quick, I'm going to go ahead and put me beside it here. I think that'll work. Oh, no, I'm, I'm back on the other thing. Um Let's see here if I can get back into, there we go. Um, this this Saturday, one good thing about the cram class is if you take the cram class, you sign up for it, and you're not testing until, say, even uh, December. Anytime we have a cram class between now and December, you can jump in on it. The only thing I need from you is to put you on the roster is I need a, a quick email just to say, Hey, it's Joe. I want to be in the, this class. So I know that the night before I can send you out everything you need to have, all the information that you need to have to be um, in that class. OK, so that's that's really technically all you really need to do. It, the good thing about it is once you join like our family and I say family is because our goal is to get you through that state exam. You are you are in. You are good. OK, so. Go ahead and I'm going to put the link below uh, as soon as we're done with this. You can go ahead and sign up for the class. We want to see you there. We have a good time. It's a little bit different format than this. We kind of go pretty fast. We go over each uh, each unit all, all the way through. We usually get up to 13 or 14. We go through it. We do little quizzes the same similar way. And you guys are going to be learning so much during that, that process. So we really want you to be there. Does anybody have any questions? I got a few over here. A few more questions. Okay, good. Kurt, awesome. Jump in there. Um, I just passed this, the class exam. Do I need to send any record? Um, what you do on the, That's a great question, Noah. What you do is your class, I teach a 63-hour course. What you do is you take your certificate, you upload it, or you bring it to the testing site. Um, they will have that information, but you should get a course completion on the 63 hour. Um, if you're allowed and it says eligible for exam, you can go ahead and do that. Um, <laughs> Casey's funny. She goes, yeah, we're like family. Tim's like my brother at this point. Yeah, I feel like uh, Casey's fun. So, um, yeah, so that, that's pretty much all you have to do. So you, you get the certificate. When you go to the testing center, you just give them that, that certificate, uh, and then they go ahead and let you they let you in the class, okay? Um, I will be starting to do the 45-hour courses. That's going to be important. That's why um, when you're finished with your exam and you passed it, stay in the group because we're going to kind of change a little bit of the format of the group. We want to kind of do stuff to help real estate professionals. 45-hour class. Uh, Kurt saying, can you take my state exam? Kurt, you're a smart guy. I know you're going to knock it down real easy. So you got it. Uh, trying to think what else. That's it. Um, Saturday is going to be a good time. We have a fun a fun group. We always do this. Very, very similar to this. I sit right here. We go through it. It's just a little di different format. We 
we really knock it out. We don't have a lot of questions until the top of the hour because a couple of people called and we're, you know, they don't want to be interrupted. We go through the information at the top of the hour. We answer questions. If it's a quick question, I go ahead and knock it out real quick too. But we go through a lot of information. You'll just it'll just build your confidence. So go ahead and sign up. Um, we've got we do have a, a a little bit more room. I think we've got enough for twelve more people. So if you can do it, try to knock it out tonight. Okay, that really helps out. Uh, it helps. And then what you do is, as soon as you sign up, you will actually get get your materials to start studying. And there's like a lot of materials. You can make flashcards. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. All right. You guys are great. I appreciate it. See you Saturday. Uh, who's my Facebook user? I'm trying. I can see him on there. Uh, Lay, uh, Casey, Lucy. Uh, let's see. Art, Daphne, Erica, Casey, Hannah, Art. You guys are all on. That's good. All right, everybody. Thumbs up. We're going to dominate this thing. Let's do it. Okay. Enjoy. <laughs>